Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll wait just a few seconds while everybody's computers are connecting. So I thank you in advance for holding. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're just waiting for a few more people to come on. We're just waiting for those little wheels to stop spinning and for everyone to get connected. We have about 350 people that have registered for today. So we'll be starting in just a few moments and thank you in advance for holding. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. We have a few housekeeping items before we start today's program. I'm Andrea Jensen. I'm the education specialist for Allergy and Asthma Network and I'm a certified asthma educator. All participants will be on mute for the webinar. We will record today's webinar, so please don't worry. We will post it in our website a few days after the webinar, so please be patient. You can find all of our recorded webinars on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Scroll down to the bottom of the page. You will see all of our upcoming webinars and any of the webinars we have given that have been recorded. The webinar will be one hour. That includes time for questions. We will take those questions at the end of the webinar, but you can put them in the Q&A tab at any time. The Q&A box is at the bottom of your screen. Please don't put the questions in the chat. I can miss those oftentimes when I'm toggling back and forth. So if you have questions for Dr. Hogan, please put those in the Q&A. We have someone monitoring the chat. If you have any questions with anything regarding the webinar or need any help, we will get to as many questions as we can before we conclude today's webinar. This webinar does have CEUs. This webinar series is part of our series, Advances in Allergy and Asthma, in partnership with the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. They offer CMEs for this particular webinar. Look for an email, which you also will receive within a few days, so please be patient. I always have people that will email me right after the webinar ended, but just wait a couple of days and you should get an email that's going to have all the links for all of the resources from Dr. Hogan, as well as the information from the credentialing. So please be patient and watch for that. Allergy and Asthma Network also offers CMEs for nurses and CRCEs for respiratory therapists. That will also be in the email. We will also put a link to the certificate in the chat. So today we're going to talk about allergies throughout the year. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Angela Duff Hogan. Angela Duff Hogan is Professor of Pediatrics at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia in the Allergy and Immunology Division at the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters and is a senior partner at the Children's Specialty Group. She graduated from the University of Louisville, Louisville. sorry, I can't get that Close. pronunciation correct. <laughs> medical school and completed her pediatric residency there at COSAIR Children's Hospital. She completed a fellowship in allergy and immunology at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, a fellowship in clinical and laboratory immunology at Virginia Commonwealth University, Medical College of Virginia, and a four-year postdoctorate study in immunology. Dr. Hogan is a fellow of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. She is vice chair for the ACAAI Asthma Committee and the AAPNCE Planning Group member representing allergy and pulmonology at the national meeting. Dr. Hogan is passionate about community education and asthma and food allergies. Nationally, she has been faculty for several practical pediatric CME courses, AAP NCE meetings, ACAAI national meetings, and visiting professor for the AAP SOAI nationally. Regionally, she has worked extensively to advocate for the health and safety of children, including forming a regional allergy support group at COPACVA.org. Dr. Hogan has developed, promoted, and participated in multiple outreach programs for schools, EMTs, 
and community physicians. Her most treasured time is playing with her or hanging out with her three amazing children and her dog, Oliver. Currently, she's learning to play the bagpipes. And my oldest son, (laughs) (laughs) it takes time. My oldest son is a a geologist and also a bagpiper. He's been playing for 14 years. It's very slow, but you will get there. Everybody needs a hobby. hobby. So Dr. Hogan, please take it away. All right. And um, my disclosures um, are here on this slide and um, have been mitigated um, through this um, speaking arrangement, too. So our objectives today, I'm really excited to get to talk with you all. Um, It's a very exciting thing to think about how the seasons change um, outside, and it also impacts how we do with our allergic rhinitis and our asthma. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of those changes. And what we know is that it's Um, something that we see and hear a lot on the news. And so I had three headlines that I wanted to grab for you first to see today. And the first one was um, from a recent publication that said smoke from wildfires may increase violent crime and also asthma attack. Another headline here is that the fog of pollen torments allergy sufferers on sunny days. And you can see here they have captured in this time release photography, a beautiful beautiful explosion of pollen from this particular pollen um, tree. And then also um, you're not imagining it, seasonal allergies are getting worse. So certainly in our public forum, uh, there's a lot of interest in seasonal allergies. And what I'd like to do is actually talk with you a little bit about some of the seasonal things that we see in allergies and asthma and how those um, triggers change throughout the seasons. So let's get started. And uh, first thing I always like to do is think about the prevalence of allergy. And I think it's very important for us to think that actually 27% of US children are allergic and 20% of kids actually have seasonal allergies, things that change throughout the year. Nearly 5 million children have been diagnosed with asthma and 60% of those asthmatic children actually have allergies also. And we know that if you're a child with allergies, you are much more likely to have asthma. And we also know that being allergic is an important risk factor for both asthma and allergic rhinitis. We know that if you have um, asthma, it significantly impacts the quality of life. And there are lots of different parameters that have been measured, but we know that it impacts your sleep. In addition to the physical symptoms, it can impact your lifestyle. There's all the medications and treatments. You can miss school or work. There's social and certainly financial impact. So knowing what's triggering asthma can be very important. And equally, what triggers allergic rhinitis can be important to address because allergic rhinitis also impacts your quality of life. We know from a recent burden of allergic rhinitis in America survey that many adults and children have sleep disruption because of their nasal symptoms. And we also know that um, there's an association between nasal um, allergies and mood. And we also know that even something as simple as your sense of smell can significantly impact your quality of life because you might not be able to taste food or there may be even health concerns if you're not able to smell things that might be threatening. So we know that if we can address triggers for both allergic rhinitis and asthma, we can improve quality of life. So I think it's important that we find out What are the allergy seasons and what do we see each season? So the first thing that we need to think about are actually what are in those seasons. And um, there are different particles that are out in the air. And most commonly, we call those um, particles allergens. And aerobiology is the study of airborne particles. And an allergen is something that can cause an IgE or allergy antibody response. And we know that those allergens can be both indoor and outdoors. And those levels of allergens actually change um, during the season, both indoor and outdoors. And we call airborne allergens aeroallergens. And they're basically um, like little feathers. They float throughout the air. They're different sizes. And sometimes they are airborne longer and other times they float down and wait for some sort of a current to carry, carry them up back higher again. There are lots and lots of sources of airborne particles. It could be a cell like a viral cell. It could be an intact um, or broken apart pollen grain. It could be from a fungus that actually the spores from a fungus or maybe the hyphae. 
It could be a protein that's dissolved in a water droplet. We know that insect feces like dust mites um, can be allergens. We also know that insect other body parts, like for example, cockroaches, um, we know their body parts can be a significant allergen. There can also be bird material that can be associated with allergies. We also know in our friends, the cats and dogs, their dander, their saliva, their urine can also be sources of allergen. And these can be attached to skin scales or dust particles, or they in and of themselves may be the right particle size to impact our airway. So what size the particle is, is a really important concept. So many particles that we breathe into our nose are fortunately really big. And so if they are particles that are greater than 10 uh, micrometers in size, they actually get trapped. They get trapped in our nose or in our throat, and then we sneeze them out or blow them out or cough them out or swallow them actually. And they're really not a particle size that in general tends to bother us. But when the particle gets smaller, somewhere between like 2.5, micrometers and 10 micrometers, then those particles can actually travel down further into our airway and may make it into our upper airway or our bronchus. And it's those exposures over a longer period of time that actually can exacerbate things like asthma or bronchitis. But the most worrisome particles are those that are 2.5 micrometers in size. And we call that the PM 2.5. And those particular particles can actually go really far down in our lungs. So they can actually go all the way down to the level of the alveoli. And particles that are that particularly small are generated oftentimes by pollutants. So things like vehicle emissions or industrial pollutants, or maybe even smoke from wildfires have really small particle size. So they can go really low in the airway. And while they're there, they can cause a lot of um, increased inflammation and association with that small particle size has been increased risk for even respiratory infections, reduced lung function, and in some studies it's been associated even with premature death. So understanding particle size is really important. But particle size alone is not all of it. We know that what's also carried in that particle can be very important. So sometimes the actual chemicals that are carried in those particles um, can impact our health. And then the individual, are, is that individual actually allergic or sensitized to a particle that might be carried really low? Or do they have underlying other problems? Perhaps maybe they're a tobacco smoke smoker, or maybe they've worked in a mine or something else that also might be increasing the inflammation in their lungs. And then how long are they exposed? And then what is the overall quality of air that they breathe every day? And all of those things come together to make an impact on the underlying allergenicity and what particles go on. So let's go on and let's start with spring. And so um, for spring, we know that the most common allergen that we see sensitization to in spring is tree pollen. And from a recent study in 2021, it said that there are approximately 81 million people in the US who have actually been diagnosed with allergic rhinitis. That's about 26% of adults and about 19% of children. And we know that pollen from trees occur at different times during the year, but most of the tree pollen happens in spring. And most common tree pollens are things like oak and birch and maple and alder and cedar and pine, which can be very early pollens. And it's very interesting to know that a birch tree can actually release about 5.5 billion grains of pollen over a year. And an alder tree does even more, 7.2 billion. And then an oak tree, about 0.6 billion. So it's a lot of pollen that can come from one little tree. So imagine a whole forest of them. What we know in the US is that there are different kind of pollination periods that people think about, and there are also different zones. So in North America, there's about eight to 10 major floral zones that we see trees and grasses and weeds start and stop during different periods. So I've listed here for you on this graph from up to date, just some different regions in the country where we see different pollen patterns. 
And we know that some tree pollen starts really early. For example, mountain cedar in Texas can actually start in December. But for me here in Virginia, we usually see pollen season starting at about Valentine's Day and lasting until about Mother's Day. And I always remind my patients that you can remember spring pollen season because you love your mother. So, and that's sometimes helpful. But we know that not only do trees pollinate during certain time periods, but sometimes some of the weeds can be um, perennial, which means all year long. And some of those in some regions are some of the weeds like plantain and sorrel. And we know that in general, when things pollinate, the wind carries that pollen. And some of them can be carried hundreds of miles, but usually they are carried only a few hundred meters because they're a little bit heavier particle. So what we know again by seeing this graph here, again, showing you some of the different regions that we see for pollen. And we know again, that things like wind speed, humidity, atmospheric factors and rainfall all determine how far the pollen goes. In general, what I tell most people, it really doesn't matter what tree is in your yard. You don't have to go cutting down any particular trees because you are allergic to those trees. What you actually do is uh, realize that those trees um, are gonna be in everybody's yard because the wind is a factor. And then we also know that um, pollen does increase when the climate is warmer. And when we have colder climates, the amounts of pollen levels actually go down. So in general, what I tell most people is most trees pollinate for about three to four weeks and then they move on to another tree. So if you're super allergic to birch pollen, for example, then you're gonna have about four weeks of significant suffering. So here's some beautiful pictures, I think, um, of pollen grains. Pollen grains are identifiable from every single individual pollinating thing. This is with a scanning electron microscope. And if you were an allergist, you would have to remember for your exam, uh, which pollen is from what tree, but I'm not going to do that today because I've forgotten. Um, but I think they're always a cool picture and I think this would be nice artwork for somebody's house or something. But I am going to take the opportunity to cover some of my favorite trees for just a moment. In our area, the oak tree is pretty significant. It's that yellow crap that's all over your car. And as you can see here, um, there's some active pollen from the oak tree. We also know that in our particular region that this is what a birch tree pollen looks like. And when we look at fall trees, when they're really pretty, they're already over their pollen stage. So the pollen again is when we are seeing the flowers that are on the trees. And then also um, you've probably seen many of these in your neighborhood. This is the maple tree. So, and what we know is that we actually can do pollen counts. So what pollen counts are is they can be very helpful. A pollen count actually tells us how much pollen is in the air. And so there are special sampler devices that usually are put on the roof of a building or in some open area where the pollen could get access to it. And the pollens are collected. And then experts who recognize what all those pollen grains are will count how many pollen grains are in a particular sample and then do some higher math, math and be able to tell us what the actual pollen count is. And when you watch it on TV and it tells you what the pollen count is locally, they're actually telling you what the pollen count was yesterday, not actually what it was today because they have to have had at least 24 hours to count up all those little pollens and decide which particular um, species of pollens are out there. But in general, pollen counts are displayed as either low, moderate, high, or very high. And what they're trying to tell you on the TV is if you are exposed because you're allergic or sensitized, then that represents the relative risk that you're going to have allergy symptoms when that particular pollen level is high. And it can be very helpful to follow pollen levels, especially if you are sensitized, but you should know that things like the air temperature and the wind and the humidity um, can be impacted. And so pollen count from yesterday may not truly be the pollen count today. We know in general that hot, dry, windy days means more pollen, but don't forget mold counts. Mold levels can also be impacted um, regionally and do have a seasonal pattern, which we'll talk about in just a minute. For tree pollen, pre peak pollen times 
are usually between about 2 p.m. and 9 p.m. So if you are super tree pollen allergic, you may wanna go for that run first thing in the morning before the trees have a chance to warm up and start dumping out their pollen. We do know that rain also impacts pollen levels and the pollen levels um, do in fact improve oftentimes when we have a rain. My grandmother used to say, oh, we need a rain, the pollen levels are so high. And people talk about the rain kind of air scrubbing the pollen out of the air. And that actually does happen in some cases. We know that smaller raindrops and more um, light rain is better at cleansing the air than larger kind of downpour droplets are. And we know that a prolonged rain shower actually can improve air quality. But there's a little more to that story and we're gonna to come to that in just a little bit. I want you to remember that not only do we see high tree pollen levels in the spring, but we also see high mold levels. Um, mold absolutely loves moisture and we can see increased mold spores both indoors and outdoors. So if there are damp basements or bathrooms or kitchen, we are gonna see a particular prevalence of certain kinds of mold and if there are outdoor areas that water has been collecting or maybe snow has melted and particular areas maybe outside the home have stayed moist, then those are prime opportunities for molds to grow. So we see a lot of mold being around in the spring also. So let's move ahead to summer. Um, in summer, the predominant pollen that we see is grass pollen, but there are other things that are allergens in the summer also. Let's not forget the importance of insect allergies. We're outdoors more, and also lots of stinging insects are outdoors more during the summer. We have not only bees, but we also have things like yellow jackets and hornets and wasps, and they have uh, particularly a lot more activity in the warmer season. And also there may be more food sources that are available for them to have um, more opportunities to sting you in the right circumstances. And again, as I mentioned, in summer, we see increasing amounts of humidity, more so than we even saw in the spring. So it again, promotes a lot more mold growth. And we know that mold can exacerbate both allergic rhinitis and asthma symptoms. The predominant pollen, again, as I mentioned in summer is grass pollen. And grass pollen can be year round if you are in a particularly warm climate like the West Coast. And we know that of all the outdoor allergens that there are opportunities to become allergic to, sensitization to grass is actually what we see the greatest number of patients allergic to in the US. Most studies say that about 40% of individuals in the US may be sensitized to grass allergen. What we also know is that um, we are seeing a encroachment of certain grasses as we see warmer and warmer areas or perhaps some areas um, due to global warming or climate change. Um, some of those um, types of um, pollens and um, foliage are moving up. So there has been a general trend, for example, of Bermuda grass to be extending northward if we look at the last 50 years. We also know that grass pollen not only causes allergic rhinitis and asthma, but it's also been associated with allergic contact dermatitis. It can cause eczema flares if you're sensitized to grass. Some people actually even get urticaria to grass. Um, we often see that in the folds of the arms or behind the legs where we sweat and that extra sweat helps trap some of that pollen and that may lead more to um, hives. And there's also irritant contact dermatitis that can happen with grass. What we know about grasses is that there are basically three main families of grass. There are the northern pasture grasses, which Timothy is probably the most important one there, but we do see a lot of perennial rye and Kentucky bluegrass in this family also. There's sort of the Johnson grass family where Bahia is also in that. And then we also see the Bermuda grass family, which tends to be more the southern grass families. And there's a whole lot of cross reactivity among these families. So oftentimes, for example, when we are doing particular immunotherapy to people that are allergic to one of these families, we only need to pick one representative grass from those families in order, in order to be able to treat them. Timothy grass, we have a whole lot where I live 
it's kind of a northern grass. It's better suited for colder climates. It has a temperature range that it particularly likes. And more southern grass, we see a lot more Bermuda grass. Um, Bermuda grass is the one that kind of goes brown um, in the winter months if it's in a colder climate. Um, it goes dormant instead of dying um, during the winter months. So there are lots of different kinds of grasses that we can see. And there's lots of things that grass allergy has been associated with. One of the things I found most fascinating when I was starting to look at grass pollen is that there's been an association of grass pollen and food allergy. So there was a recent publication called the Health Nut Study, and this was a big population cohort of about 5,000 infants in Australia. And one of the things that they did in that study is they looked at grass pollen exposure during pregnancy and also in the first six months of life for each of the infants that were in this cohort. And what they also did was measure grass pollen counts every day. And they said that if there was a significant increase in pollen during a particular day, then they would consider that to be a higher risk day. Then they took those infants and they tested them for food allergy. They looked at egg and peanut and sesame seed and either milk or shrimp. And they did this by skin prick test. And then in those people that actually had positive skin prick test, which means sensitization, they went ahead and did oral food challenges so that they can confirm that they actually did in fact have the food allergy. And they came up with three types of people. They had the people who were not sensitized, those people who were sensitized, but could tolerate the food. And then they had those people who actually were sensitized and actually had proven food challenge positive um, allergies. And what they found is that if there was a high level of grass exposure between the 10th and 12th weeks of pregnancy, then those infants were at increased risk for egg and peanut sensitization. So what was happening to mom while she was pregnant um, actually impacted the sensitization rate for kids. They also found that if there were high pollen exposures in the first seven days of life, that there was an also an increased risk of peanut sensitization in those kids. And then equally interesting, if there was a prolonged elevated exposure with multiple points during the first four to six months of life, that there was an increased risk of egg sensitization. And that if mom had a history of food allergy, she had a high exposure during her 10th to 12th week of pregnancy, and there was a high pollen exposure in four to six months in the baby, that those kids were more likely to have true egg and peanut allergy confirmed by challenges. And this was independent of whether or not the egg and peanut got introduced between four and six months. So I think that's very interesting that we think that grass pollen can maybe potentially be a cofactor for sensitization to foods. Equally demonstrated was a recent case study that was published in the Annals. And in this case study, they had a four-year-old patient who had a documented peanut allergy and they were on peanut OIT. And they did have a 10 millimeter positive skin test to grass. During their OIT, both buildup and maintenance phases, there were four episodes of anaphylaxis. And two of those episodes were in the maintenance phase and they were not related to missing a dose, a concurrent illness, physical activities. The doses weren't given on an empty stomach. They weren't able to find any reason why the child should have anaphylaxed to their OIT other than they were grass allergic and the grass pollen levels were high at that particular time. So what they stated is that this case demonstrated the importance of considering seasonal timing of anaphylaxis while on OIT and that grass pollen sensitization and exposure could possibly be an additional extrinsic cofactor for the risk of anaphylaxis. And then likewise, all of us sometimes worry about patients who have EOE and when they are sensitized to a particular pollen and they're in pollen season, sometimes their EOE is worse during that pollen season, or perhaps if they get endoscopy during that pollen season, even though they may be avoiding their foods, we may also see increased eosinophils because of their previous pollen sensitization. So I think this raises a lot of questions about grass pollen sensitization and um, food allergy association.
We also know that grass pollen and asthma tend to run very closely together too. There was a recent systematic review on the relationship of grass pollen exposure to asthma exacerbations. And this meta-analysis showed that the strongest associations were found between asthma attacks, asthma ED visits or hospitalizations, when the grass pollen concentrations were high in the previous two days in children who were less than 18. And it also showed when you were sensitized and the pollen levels were high, that you also have lower lung function. And in an Australian study, they also showed that readmission to the hospital was associated with higher levels of grass pollen um, with a significant incidence ratio. So I wanna tell you a recent story. So this is a recent story from November of 2016. It's in Melbourne, Australia. They were experiencing an unprecedented heat wave. The temperatures on this particular day climbed to 95 degrees, and it was one of the hottest recorded um, during that particular year. And the pollen counts there were extremely high. They're predominantly rye grass in Melbourne. Then between 7 and 8.30 p.m., the temperature suddenly dropped to the low 60s, and a thunderstorm erupted with severe wind gusts. Within an hour, the emergency medical services started to receive hundreds of calls for people that were in acute respiratory distress and having breathing difficulties. By midnight, they'd received over 1,300 phone calls, more cases than they could actually send their ambulances out to. Within 30 hours of the thunderstorm, there were over 3,000 respiratory-related ER visits and 476 hospital admissions. In total, there were about 10,000 people who needed treatment in the hospital emergency department for asthma attack within a short time of this thunderstorm. 10 people died and six of them were within a week of the storm. So what's up with that? This is called thunderstorm asthma. And while we can see it locally, there can also be epidemic levels of thunderstorm asthma in certain locations. What thunderstorm asthma is, is it is an asthma exacerbation or attack that immediately follows a thunderstorm during a pollen season. These have been reported across the world during pollen season that first started reporting in, a, in the 1980s. And every time there's a high pollen count and a thumber, thunderstorm, it doesn't always trigger asthma, but there are certain um, factors that need to line up and make a particular place much more susceptible to it. When we look at what happened in Melbourne, it's important to remember that first of all, ryegrass pollen, which is their number one pollen there, is a very large particle. And if you remember what I told you, 35 micrometer particles are gonna get trapped probably in the nose or the bronchi. But in this, um, or nose are actually throat and probably won't even make it to the bronchi. In this particular case though, the, there was very high humidity. And with that very high humidity, the pollen actually um, ruptured and released a lot of much smaller particles. And those much smaller particles, less than three micrometers were easily inhaled deep into the lungs. What I think is most interesting about this story is the fact that it wasn't asthmatics who were having asthma, although all the mortality was in patients who already had asthma and were predisposed because they were sensitized but actually 28% of the people who had an asthma attack in Melbourne actually only had allergic rhinitis. So being sensitized to allergic rhinitis, it's that one airway kind of theory, being sensitized, having the right size particle that got low enough in their lungs, they had a significant asthma attack when they previously had not had a physician diagnosis of asthma. So that's a little bit scary when you think about it. And when we think about thunderstorm and asthma in this other schematic here, what happens in kind of meteorological simple terms is that pollen or even mold spores have been shown to do it. They kind of get swept up here into the clouds and that extra moisture can actually kind of split those particles into smaller particles. But the lightning is also a factor because the lightning and the ionic charge can also help split those particles. So we get a lot larger, uh, smaller fragments that are, are now able to penetrate the lower parts of the lung. And what the current thinking is and why I put thunderstorms in summer is that 
Um, we do think that thunderstorms are more present in summer, but also climate change and air pollution have become an important cofactor for the development of um, thunderstorm asthma and pollen related disease. So let's go there and let's spend a minute and talk about climate change. Is climate change in fact impacting the development of allergy and what we see? Well, just a moment of a side comment, global warming and climate change aren't necessarily the same thing, although a lot of people use them in the same breath. Global warming has to do with increasing the temperature of the earth and climate change just has to do with things that are changing, like colder areas might be getting colder, warmer areas might be getting warmer, dry areas might be getting drier, et cetera. What we have seen is that over the past 50 years, the average global temperature has increased at the fastest rate in recorded history. And we think that global warming is related to greenhouse effects. And what we are seeing is that this greenhouse effect is changing precipitation patterns. It makes wetter areas wetter. It can make drier areas drier. It also changes insect and rodent um, borne activity and diseases. It changes ozone levels, um, which can impact respiratory ailments. Potentially it can contaminate drinking water due to flooding. And we also see climate change driven droughts and floods um, that can uh, affect our agriculture, which ultimately can impact um, food insecurities. And what we are also seeing, it is increasing the prevalence of allergies as one of our early slides did in fact tell us. So why is it changing things? It has to do with the CO2. The correlation has been shown between CO2 levels and the prevalence of asthma and allergic rhinitis. CO2 has a big impact on pollen. It actually makes the plants grow faster and bigger. They produce more pollen. And then the pollen they do produce has more allergenic proteins and they start pollinating earlier and the growing season is longer than it used to be. And when we look at something like ragweed, for example, um, there are differences in how well the ragweed grows in the garden um, or out on a farm away from the city. Um, so we know that there's a lot more ragweed pollen in urban areas than there are in rural areas. And that's thought to be partly due to increased CO2 in the rural, I mean, in the urban areas that make the ragweed plants much happier. So they grow bigger and taller and have more pollen um, the ragweed plants that are in the city than the ragweed plants that are out on the side of the road in a rural area. Um, there is one study that showed there was an association um, between um, the actual increase in outdoor temperature and emergency room visits for asthma. And there's also been another study for birch pollen that shows higher ozone levels have increased the allergenicity of birch pollen also. So the effects of CO2 are in fact impacting um, the pollen levels and the plants in our environment. So how many of you remember the week of June 13th this year? It wasn't that long ago. And if you remember, um, the headlines were, none of your patients are safe from wildfires. So I think that we should spend just a moment and talk about wildfires because it looks like we are gonna have a few more wildfires before the summer is over. Wildfires are generally more common in the summer and they're particularly in regions that experience hot and dry conditions. There are several factors that contribute to increased occurrence of wildfires during the summer months, certainly drier weather. Um, we also know that um, vegetation may tend to dry out, especially in late summer and make it more of a fire hazard. We know that lightning can actually increase the risk for wildfires. And then people are out and about doing stuff and they're not always careful and they can also contribute to wildfires. So why are wildfires an issue and why are they something we need to discuss with our patients? So we do know that climate change is increasing the vulnerability of many forests to wildfires. And we know that wildfire smoke does have small particulate matter that has other things associated with it like carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxides and various volatile organic compounds, but they also are small particles and they can go really small down into the airway where they can increase inflammation and lead to bronchospasm 
We know that smoke exposure increases respiratory hospitalizations, emergency room visits, and also with that increased inflammation, it may make them more susceptible to respiratory infections also. We know that the particle size is especially dangerous for children whose lungs are still developing. And there are some studies that suggest exposure to small particles, um, especially particles in pollution, may lead to the development of asthma. So what are the tips I tell my patients? I tell them to pay attention to what the TV is saying in terms of air quality and particle size and how many parts are out there. And then the other thing I tell them is that they should stay indoors. They should keep the indoor air in and the outdoor air out, and they should get effective N95 mask if they have to be outside when the air quality is poor. And then if they say evacuate an area, they need to evacuate it. And we need to protect the most vulnerable and those individuals that are exposed to extreme climate events. So now we're to fall. And the most common fall allergen is weed. Weed pollen is prevalent during the autumn months. The most common weed that we talk about is ragweed. It grows wild everywhere. And we just mentioned it's especially prevalent on the East Coast and the Midwest. And you can see here's another little schematic where you can see weed comes in. When I lived in Kentucky, we said that ragweed came in on August 15th and it almost did every single year. Here in um, the coastal Virginia area, it comes in about August 1st. But there are other weeds that happen too. We have things like cockleburrow and lamb's quarters and also um, mugwort, which tend to be very prevalent in these areas. And what we know about ragweed is that this particular weed likes open areas and fields and roadsides and vacant lots. They can grow super tall, up to five feet, and they produce these little pretty greenish flowers that you can see here in this picture. What's very interesting is that ragweed was not native to Europe, but got introduced into Europe after about World War I and that because of climate change, ragweed species is spreading very quickly across Europe and they are having um, significant um, disease burden because of ragweed um, exposure. They do like disturbed soil and construction sites and abandoned agricultural fields. And we know that one single plant can actually produce about a billion grains of pollen per season. They are carried in the wind and it is a very important cause of pollen-related allergic rhinitis. There are different breeds of, or species of um, ragweed, and the most important allergen is AMBA1. And on the ragweed pollen, there are actually 12 different allergens. And if you are sensitized to multiple allergens, then you actually have a higher risk for allergic asthma. We know that asthma symptoms actually occur in about 25% of ragweed allergic patients. And we know that ragweed pollen causes asthma twice as often as other types of pollen. We also know that how much pollen is out there actually is also associated with how many symptoms you're gonna have. The highest ragweed levels um, are usually at midday and the lowest levels of ragweed are about six in the morning. And Nature actually published a recent article that sort of suggested that there are certain levels of ragweed pollen that are associated with higher symptom levels. We do know that if we double the atmospheric CO2 concentration, we are gonna make ragweed plant happy and they are going to grow and grow and grow. And there was a recent study that also said that if we do allergy shots to ragweed effectively, we do impact um, asthma and severity of symptoms. So that's encouraging. I do want to mention fire ants. Fire ants are on the move when we are in fall. Um, normally, they like to have warm areas. So they migrate when it starts to get a little bit colder to warmer surfaces, such as concrete slabs or asphalt roads. And um, they can then be easily missed if you are out and about and doing things, and if you get into a swarm of fire ants, um, then they can be associated with very painful bites. As you know, the fire ant kind of clamps down with his mouth and he lifts his butt up and he um, stings by twisting his abdomen. And oftentimes we see a circular pattern. And then what happens is we see these little blister-like areas. What we also know is that about one to 3% of the population actually um, can develop IgE-mediated anaphylactic type symptoms to fire ants. Um, and we are seeing the fire ant migrate further and further north 
Um, and currently they are as far as Virginia because we have fire ants in this particular area too. We know that um, fall is a very important exposure for mold. And the most important mold here is Altenaria. And Altenaria um, peaks on warm sunny days and the levels can be very, very high. And Alt-1, um, Alt-A1 is the most important allergen and it's a really important allergen. We know that exposure to Altenaria spores have been described as the most important allergenic source associated with asthma in the arid area of the world. Sensitization to alternary has unequivocally been associated with increased asthma severity. And about 13% of the population is sensitized to alternaria. And so it is an extremely important allergen in the fall. We also know that there's a seasonality to dust mites. Dust mites do thrive as the humidity in the house goes up. And there's some studies that show dust mite levels can be much higher in the fall. So let's spend just a moment and talk about winter. Winter, we move indoors and allergen levels indoors are mostly associated with indoor allergens like dust mites and pets and cockroaches, but mold levels can significantly increase. We also know that we bring a lot of other crap into our house, like additional triggers from scented candles and air fresheners and strong odors and irritants. And then we know cold air itself can also be a trigger of asthma. And then also we see an increase of respiratory infections during winter, and that also can lead to increased allergies, allergic rhinitis and asthma. Indoor molds are very prevalent and some outdoor molds actually move indoors during the winter months. And we know the higher the humidity, um, the more likely we are to develop mold. And mold, unlike mildew, doesn't die down when it freezes, it just goes dormant, and then it's available to come back. We also know that cold air can be a trigger of asthma. We think that's partially because the cold air actually strips our airways of water, and those changes in osmolality in the airway can lead to bronchospasm. So what we oftentimes tell families that are out exercising with asthma in the cold, it is important to wear a scarf or a mask over their nose to help prevent the evaporation and the cold air trigger of asthma. But even if we take it cool and cozy by the fireside, let's remember that the fireplace has small particles and those particles can be irritants and can also trigger asthma. So we need to be very careful, um, even though it's a, a desirable place that can trigger asthma in sensitive individuals. So seasonal allergies are quite common and can cause significant discomfort for those affected. Let's review for one second, what are the symptoms that we see associated with allergic rhinitis? You know these, it's sneezing, runny nose, obstructed nose, itching, post-nasal drip, fatigue, we get itching of the eyes and also itching of the inner ear. And I just wanted to remind you again what asthma symptoms look like most commonly is cough, but can also be associated with wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and also um, exercise induced bronchospasm. And when we think about allergens, there are lots of different available resources that will tell us how to treat those allergens from staying indoors, closing windows, making sure we run the air conditioner to potentially HEPA filters. If we have pets, uh, certainly we can wash the pets or have HEPA filters. In those particular cases, there are things we can do to eliminate mold. There are things we can do to reduce uh, dust mite. And there are many resources that are available on the allergy and asthma network that will tell you how to treat um, allergens that you've been exposed to. The most important thing to manage your allergy and asthma symptoms is remember what your triggers are. So get tested so you can know what triggers your asthma and allergic rhinitis symptoms. Try to avoid contact or reduce exposure if you have particular allergens that you can. And then it's important to make an effective treatment um, schedule with your um, provider so that you can treat those symptoms when they occur throughout the seasons. And then um, from one of our recent presidents of the American College of Allergy and Asthma Immunology, Dr. Foncier, she said it's really important that you get ahead of it. So sometimes if you know, for example, that you have spring or fall time symptoms, you might wanna start taking your medicine two or three weeks before those particular pollens become prevalent so that you are not trying to um, put the horse back in the barn and have to go chase him over the hill. 
so much easier to just shut the barn door. Again, another Kentucky analogy from the Kentucky girl. So I'd like to thank you all and we'll open it up for discussion at this point and thank you all for attending. Thank you, Dr. Hogan. That was a wealth of information and hopefully you didn't hear me clickety clacking away as I was <laughs> taking notes. So let me turn my camera on here. So um, I liked what um, the last quote you had there about the allergy meds, about getting ahead of them kind of before the season starts. And um, one thing my kids joke about, they're all adults, but when they come back home to visit, I, I give them an Easter basket. And inside that Easter basket, I go to a certain warehouse store and stuck up on all the allergy meds and that's what they get in their Easter basket. I'll put a little bit of chocolate in there, but you know, that's about the time of year. So um, like you say, we have to look ahead and get going before. Don't wait till you start sneezing and, and then start taking whatever your allergy meds are. So I love that quote. That's fantastic. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Let me read those off. Um, I got COVID-19 in January, but I've had allergies my entire life. Until recently, I never had an issue with air quality, but now I have to wear a KN95 regardless of the air quality. Can allergies get worse from COVID-19 and make your body more sensitive to air quality? It's an excellent question. Um, and um, in general, uh, COVID has changed our immune system in 101 ways. Um, it has um, turned off some things that we thought um, maybe protective features, and it's turned on other things that, um, and sort of run with them. I do think that COVID has been associated with increase in allergies in some individuals. And um, so it makes perfect sense to me that you may have been perfectly fine. And now post COVID, you are seeing changes in your immune system. Although naturally, sometimes, um, even without COVID, we do see natural changes in our immune system. In general, we see outdoor allergies start at about the age of three and they peak usually about the age of 15. And then somewhere around the age of 65 or 70, we start to see those allergies start to decrease some and diminish. That's assuming we don't do anything to change um, our allergy immune system with any kind of um, immunotherapy. Thank you. Uh, another question we have, is it, oh, we hear this all the time. Is it true that children can outgrow allergies and or asthma? Gosh, this would be a whole nother lecture probably, um, but in short, uh, yes and no. So um, we do think that sensitization for most people um, may in fact be lifelong. What probably changes the most for kids, I think, is the actual airway. So when you're a little and you got a little tiny nose and let's say you're allergic to cat and you have inflammation in your nose, you don't have a lot of room to move that snot out. Maybe you can't blow your nose very well. And so um, the cat allergen exposure may have a lot bigger impact. But as you grow and, and go through puberty and your head gets bigger and your nose gets bigger um, and you can blow your nose and you might take your medicine too and there are more available medicines, um, the impact of those allergens sometimes become less. Um, sometimes people may skin test positive to one thing and then 10 years later may not be positive to it, but I'm not sure I might call into question whether or not the first skin test was true or not. In general, we think sensitization to things um, sort of follows a certain life cycle where you know you remain sensitized to them, but maybe your impact or exposure changes. So I, I don't know about allergies that you specifically um, are sent, sent to outgrow them. Asthma, all a whole different can of worms. There are different asthma trajectories, whether you're an asthmatic who has pollen allergy or whether you're an asthmatic who has viral induced asthma, um, those have different endpoints. So we do see kids outgrow their asthma all the time, um, but it tends to be more the viral driven asthma. Thank you. Um, another one says, when is the best time to start start allergy immunotherapy depending on the season? So in general, I, and I'm a moderately conservative allergist. So um, if you're asking specifically about the season, I think that if you are enormously allergic to let's say grass pollen, you could still start allergy shots during grass season because you remember that um, the way that allergy shots work is that you start with 
a really small amount in the beginning, and then you build up as you go along. So there's a safety net that is built into allergy shots if you're starting a particular season and that pollen level is high. We do know that further and further that you get along in immunotherapy, um, we do still see some local reactions when pollen levels are super high. And there is a low risk for a systemic reaction if you are super pollen allergic and in your pollen season. So I think probably the best time to start allergy shots, if it's indicated with you and your provider, is probably when they feel like it's indicated. And I probably wouldn't worry about what season it is because there's built-in factors in immunotherapy that'll help keep you safe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then a, another part of that that could go along with that is when is the best time to get allergy tested? Because if someone has to go off their allergy meds for a week before they do the skin prick test, then uh, can someone go a week without the skin prick test in the middle of summer where if they have a grass pollen? So um, do you normally have people do that year round? I, th I think one of my kids had to wait till the middle of winter because that's the only time he could go off his allergy meds for long enough. So, so what's your advice on that? So certainly winter is a lot easier to be able to come off of your allergy medicine if you are someone who is particularly seasonally pollen allergic. But most people can tolerate coming off their medicine for a week, although it's a miserable week. Um, so I think it just kind of depends on when you get to that threshold of like, we've had enough and we'd like to know what's causing our allergies and we need to have skin testing. And so sometimes people just can't come off their medicine during the pollen season and I'll say, okay, let's shuffle these medicines, try to get you under better control right now. And then we'll wait till the winter if you seem to be particularly pollen allergic before we'll skin test you. But theoretically, you could skin test during any season. Um, and if you skin test during any season, you can get your therapy started earlier if you in fact are gonna do immunotherapy. But again, immunotherapy may not be for everyone. It may just be the importance of identifying what they're allergic to so that you know when to stop and start other medicines. So the value in skin testing isn't just for allergy shots. It's actually to know when your asthma might be at risk or when we might need to step up certain therapies or step down certain therapies as you come in and out of season. So I wouldn't wait to go find out what you're allergic to because you think you're allergic to grass and you're miserable just because it's grass season. Okay, thank you. Uh, another um, question we had on there is that it just seems like, and this was on one of your slides, I believe about uh, the prevalence rate now for allergies and seems like decades ago that it was maybe 10% of the population. And then I'm um, seeing on some of your slides, it was closer to 30% for um, some people. So um, is that, do you think that will continue to increase? Do you think that's going to stay the same? I mean, with climate change and, and, and things just changing a little bit, well, I think we're going, going to continue to see um, increasing prevalence of allergy due to a host of things. Um, we, you know, there are epigenetic changes, there are environmental changes. Um, certainly, um, there are changes in uh, antibiotic usage. There are changes in pollutants. Um, there are so many factors that are all coming together. I think we're going to continue to see an increased rise and allergen um, sensitization in susceptible individuals. Okay, thank you. I, I thought that I seem, seem to see a lot more allergy commercials on now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, a lot more people are joining our misery club. Um, we have another question that says, can cleaning your nose and scraping your tongue help with allergy symptoms? So I don't know about scraping your tongue as much, um, cause you can disturb, um, some of the protective flora there. So I don't know that I would, um, talk about, but clearly wiping the pollen out of your nose. We do know that even something as simple as nasal irrigation, um, with a saline solution can improve, um, the pollen, you could get it out. Um, and so it doesn't have to go a little bit further and be sneezed out, or it's not there to cause a local reaction in your nose. So, um, but I don't, I don't know that I'd recommend scraping your tongue. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Sometimes we just need to leave good enough alone. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're just about to the end of our time. Let me just scroll through and see if there's a couple more questions. Um, why do you, so you can see, Oh, too. thank you. Right. Why do immunosuppressive drugs seem to make my allergies and asthma worse? Um, this person had a kidney transplant a few years ago. Ah, this is a tough question. So um, 
immunosuppressants um, may suppress one part of your immune system, um, but not an, another part of your immune system. So um, even for example, although this is not the exact thing in patients that have HIV, for example, who have a significant suppression of their T cells, we see significant elevation of their IgE levels. Um, we know that in sometimes people who have transplants, they actually sometimes get the pollen or the food allergy sensitization profile of their donor. Um, so uh, there's a, a lot of um, very interesting concepts um, that happen. So even though you are immunosuppressed, we didn't suppress all of your immune system. Um, you still have the opportunity to um, have um, some allergy symptoms, um, depending upon what immunosuppressants you're on. So that's something I probably would discuss with my immunologist, uh, but it's not unheard of to develop allergies after you're on immunosuppressants. Okay, lots of complicated uh, issues going on with these bodies. Um, our last question, I want to be respectful of your time. I'm sure you need to get back to your patients. Is um, someone's asking about, they had severe allergic reactions in the fall in their 20s that seemed to lessen um, to next to no reactions over the years. So it sounds like their allergies are getting a little bit better. And that can happen. Um, and also, again, it may be exposure. And, and then get, remember, there's a whole milieu of stuff. So there may be other factors that are better for you. Let's say, for example, you had severe allergies and you were living with a cat and you were allergic to a cat too. So you had that baseline cat on board and then you dump the pollen on top, but now you don't live with a cat anymore. So your glass is no longer full. It may be just half full. So you've got to take all of the environmental things together. Maybe you were living with a smoker. Maybe you lived um, near the highway where there was diesel fuel. All of those things are cofactors that may influence what your allergy looks like. So, but it's great if you're having less allergies, I think that's the most important thing. And we want everybody's quality of life to be improved. So I'm happy that, that they're not bothering you as much. And um, it would be hard to retrospectively know exactly what was going on when, but I'm glad you're better. Thank you. Lot, lots of complicated cases here. For those of you that want to go back and to review um, some of the information today, this has been recorded. It will be up on our website within a few days. So feel free to review the video share it with friends, family members, colleagues. Um, this has been a lot of great information. So thank you again, um, Dr. Hogan. And for those of you that need CMEs or any sort of continuing education credits, um, just be patient. You will get an email just within a couple of days. Today's Thursday. So don't know if it will go out tomorrow or not, or if it will go out on Monday. But um, in that email, and it will be from Zoom, it will have all the resources for everything that Dr. Hogan talked about today. You can click on the links to be able to get any of your continuing education credits. It will also have the link to the recorded video. So be patient. That will be coming your way. So lots of kudos in, in our uh, coming up in our little chat here. So yeah. our next webinar, we're, we're actually um, bundling these up a little bit. Normally we just uh, have one per uh, month, but the next webinar will be on Monday and that will also have um, continuing education credits or CMEs, whatever you need. So that's allergen immunotherapy for asthma guidelines and real life applications. Uh, once again, if you can't make that, please register because you'll still get the link and you can watch the recording whenever it fits around your schedule. So thank you again for joining us. This is Andrea Jensen for the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network. Join us as we work every day to breathe better together and help control our allergies. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day.